The new lodger glanced down briefly at the plate which had just been put in front of him and turned towards the window with a faint smile, as though acknowledging that the day was fair enough outside, even if there was something foul within. I can't take egg, sorry. Can't take? Mrs. Ella McLean still kept her thumb on the oozy edge of a heap of scrambled yellow. No, it's an allergy. Oh, one of those. That's interesting. Oh, but you could take a lightly boiled egg, couldn't you? No. It's an allergy to egg. You mean any egg? Any and every egg, Mrs. McLean, in all forms. Egg is poison to me. Harry Beach did not raise his voice at all, but this time his landlady withdrew the plate rather quickly. She put it on one side and sat down at the other end of the table. Yes, that is interesting, she said. I've known the strawberries and the shellfish and the cat's fur, and of course I've heard of the egg, although I've never met it. Veach said nothing. He broke a piece of toast. No, I've never met it, though I've met eggs disagreeing. I mean, really disagreeing. Veach was pressing his lips with a napkin. Not the same thing, he said. When I say poison, I mean poison, pains, vomiting, and I wouldn't like to say what else, violent. Not many people understand just how violent. There was a silence, while Mrs. McLean, with a soft white napkin, gently, gently brushed away the scratchy toast crumbs which lay between them in the centre of the table. Do you find people sympathetic, then? she inquired at last. Veach gave a short laugh. <laughs> Mrs. McLean, when, may I ask, have people ever been sympathetic to anything out of the ordinary? I suppose that's true. They both turned their heads to look out onto the Edinburgh street, already crowded with people going to work. There was a stiffish breeze. Visitors from the south, like Veach, used the word gale and those going eastwards had their teeth bared against it and their eyes screwed up in a grimace which made them appear very unsympathetic indeed. Mrs. McLean was a widow. She was an amiable woman in her middle years, and lately she had begun to wonder whether sympathy was not her strongest point. In the weeks that followed, Veach's status changed from lodger to paying guest. From paying guest, by a more subtle transformation, shown only in Mrs. McLean's softer expression and tone of voice, to a guest who, in the long run, paid. They talked together in the mornings and evenings. Sometimes they talked about his work, which was in the refrigerating business. But as often as not, the conversation veered round to eggs. As a subject, the egg had everything. It was brilliantly self-contained and clean, light but meaty, delicate yet full of complex, far-reaching associations, psychological, sexual, physiological, philosophical. There was almost nothing on earth that did not start off with an egg in some shape or form. And when they had discussed eggs in the abstract, Veach would tell her about all those persons who had tried their best to poison him, coming after him with their great homemade cakes rich with egg, boggy egg puddings nourishing to the death, or the stiff drifts of meringue-topping custards, yellow as cowslip. You'd be amazed, he said. Even persons who profess to love one aren't above mixing in the odd egg. Just a test, just to make absolutely certain one isn't trying it on. Oh, heavens! Oh, no! cried Mrs. McLean. Love! Love in one hand and poison in the other! By early spring, Mrs. McLean and her lodger were going out together in his car on a Saturday, sometimes to a quiet tea room on the outskirts of the city, or further out into the country, where they would stretch their legs for a bit before having a leisurely high tea in some small hotel, where, as often as not, Mrs. McLean would inform waitresses and sometimes waiters about Harry Veach's egg allergy. Then Veach would sit back and watch the dishes beckoned or waved away.
would hear with an impassive face the detailed discussions of what had gone into the make-up of certain pies and rissoles, and would occasionally see Mrs. McLean reject a bare-faced egg outright. He never entered into such discussions. It almost seemed as though he had let her take over the entire poisonous side of his life. Before long, Mrs. McLean had given up eating eggs herself. She wouldn't actually say they disagreed with her nowadays. That would be carrying it too far. But how could what was poison to him be nourishment to her? By early summer, she and her guest had explored the surrounding countryside and every out-of-the-way restaurant in the city. Mrs. McLean gave him a great deal. It was not only his stomach she tended. She gave him bit by bit but steadily and systematically, the history of Edinburgh as they went about. "'You're standing on history!' she would exclaim, nudging him off a piece of paving stone, or, as he stood wedged momentarily in the archway of a close on a wild afternoon, her voice would rise triumphantly above the howlings and whistlings around him. "'You're breathing in history! Look at that inscription above your head!' By late autumn, Veach had got his job well in hand. It was expanding, he said, really bursting its bounds. Mrs. McLean knew little about his job, but she identified with it, and she was not one to stand in the way of his work. He was not so available now. He worked late and had little appetite for the original eggless dishes she set before him at supper. Worst of all, when a few days of unexpected Indian summer began... A sudden spate of work took him away from her for longer and longer sessions. He began to be busy on Saturday afternoons, and even on Sundays he found he must use the car to make certain contacts he'd not had time for during the week. Reluctantly, Mrs. McLean decided that until the pressure of work slackened, she would simply take a few bus trips on her own while the weather lasted. She set off, good-naturedly enough, on solitary sprees at the weekends, as often as not ending up with tea alone in some country hotel or seaside cafe where they had been earlier in the year. One Saturday afternoon, she took the bus right out into the country to an old farmhouse where they had been a couple of months ago. It stood well back from the road amongst low, gorse-covered hills, and winding through these were deep paths where you could walk for miles in a wide circle, eventually coming out again near the house. Mrs. McLean decided to take her walk after tea. It was one of the last warm days of the year, so warm that after half an hour or so she had to remove her coat and a mile further on uphill she was glad to lean on a gate and look down to where, far off, she could just see the line of the crags and Arthur's seat with the blue haze of the city beneath. Near at hand the weeds of the fields and ditches were a bright yellow, yet creamed here and there in the hollows with low swathes of ground mist. But something jerked her from her trance. She realised with a shock that she was not the only person enjoying the surroundings. Unseen, yet close to her behind the hedge, there were human rustlings and murmurings. She bent further over the gate and craned her head sideways to look. Seated on a tartan rug, which came from the back of her own drawing-room sofa, was Harry Veach, his arm round the waist of a young woman whose hair was yellow as egg yolk. Their legs lay together, the toes of their shoes pointed towards one another, and Mrs. McLean noted that under a dusting of seeds and straws, Veach's shoes still bore the traces of the very shine she had put there the night before. For a few seconds longer she stood staring. Then Mrs. McLean suddenly lifted her hands from the top of the gate as though it had been electrically wired turned swiftly and silently down the way she had come and made for the bus route back to the city.'
Sunday breakfast had always been a more prolonged affair than on other days, and the next morning Harry Veach came downstairs late in green and white striped pyjamas under a maroon dressing gown. He looked at ease, and on his forehead was a faint glow which was nothing more nor less than the beginning and end of a Scottish sunburn, for the weather had broken. Mrs. MacLean greeted him, seated sideways at the table as usual, to show that she had already eaten. But now Veach was showing a strange hesitation in lowering himself into his seat. For some moments he seemed to find extraordinary difficulty in removing his gaze from the circumference of the plate before him, as though its rim were magnetic to the eyes, which, try as they might to burst aside, were kept painfully riveted down dead on its centre. But at last, with tremendous effort, he managed to remove them. Casually, smiling, he looked round the room at curtains, pot plant, fire screen, sideboard, greeting them first before he spoke. Mrs. MacLean, I can't take egg, sorry. Can't take? There was a cold surprise in her voice. Beach allowed himself one darting glance at the smooth boiled egg on his plate and another at the mottled oval of his landlady's face and again let his eyes roam easily about the room. <laughs> no, it's an allergy, he said. Mrs. MacLean now got up with the teapot in her hand and poured out a cup for her lodger. I don't quite catch your meaning, Mr. Beach, she said coming round and standing with the spout cocked at his ear as though she would pour the brown brew into his skull. "'An allergy, Mrs. MacLean,' said Veach, speaking with the distinct enunciation and glassy gaze of one practising his vocabulary in a foreign tongue. "'I have an allergy to egg.' "'Do you mean you want special treatment here, Mr. Veach?' Mrs. MacLean, I am allergic to egg. Egg is poison to me, deadly poison. Mrs. MacLean's face was blank, her voice flat as she answered, Then why should you stay here, in an egg house? An egg house? The vision of a monstrous six-compartment egg box had flashed before Veach's eyes. Yes, I love eggs, she replied simply. Eggs are my favourite. I shall order two dozen eggs tomorrow. There will be eggs, fresh eggs, for breakfast, for lunch, for supper. Did you know there are ways of drinking eggs? One can even break an egg onto the soup for extra nourishment. I have books crammed with recipes specifically for the egg. There are a thousand and one ways... Poison! cried Harry Veach. Yes, indeed, if you stay. A thousand and one ways, she agreed. And for a start, with the expression of an irate conjurer, she produced a second boiled egg out of a bowl and nimbly bowled it across the table towards her shrinking lodger.